Yesterday when we, I guess it was last April when we signed up for that silly thing and ran it yesterday, there was this little lady holding the sign about seven miles into it and said, this was a good idea four months ago. That's cute. can't believe you wrote that. And, uh, one little sign, lady had a sign up there and she said, life is short, running makes it feel longer. <laughs> She's right. And, uh, but you know, when you sign up for something like Tough Mudders, you sign up to do a big run if you join a sporting team and you know what's ahead of you. It shouldn't have surprised anybody yesterday that we were going to run in mud. It's called Tough. So if you get there and go, oh, mud, okay, you're an idiot. All right, it says mud. It's going to be mud. If you were surprised that there were going to be tall buildings or platforms to jump off of, did you not watch the video? You know that was coming. And so when you sign up to do something like that, you just kind of know what's ahead. You know that there's going to be electricity pulsating through your body at certain points. It's just going to happen. It's called electroshock therapy. And I need therapy from now on. But I mean, there's going to be things that are going to happen to you because you've signed up for this. But in life, things are going to happen to you. You had no idea that was coming. You had no idea the doctor was going to say, you have 90% blockage in this side of your heart. You had no idea that a doctor was going to come back and say, there's a lump right here. We had to figure out what that is. And instantly, at that moment, life is forever changed. You are now on a marathon. You are now running a different race than you thought you were going to be running. You go to work that day, and the doctor, the, your boss says, I'm going to have to let you go. You are now on a different marathon. You didn't see that coming. It's one thing to know that it's coming because you can train and get amped up for it and be ready. It's another thing entirely when you wake up thinking all is well and you go down that night and all is no longer well. It's a different ball game. Sometimes you'll see it coming. Sometimes you don't realize it until the race has already begun. Some of you have been through those events. You can look backwards in your life and go, yeah, I remember that. I beat cancer. I remember that. We made it through in our marriage. I remember that. I remember that unemployment period of my life. I remember those events. We made it through. Some of you are in the middle of those things. And you're wondering, how is this going to work? You purchase a new house. All after a time of prayer, counsel, and study, you move into that house. Only to discover the myriad of problems you've just purchased. I'm not thinking of anyone in particular. <laughs> you guys all bought new houses this next week. But that happens, doesn't it? It's really bad when you... Seek God's wisdom. You seek God's counsel of what am I going to do? Lord, is this what you want? And you're convinced this is what God wants for my life. And you do it. And then once you get into it, the wheels fall off. And then you're left wondering, did I misunderstand God? Did God mislead me? Do I need new counselors? Do I need to find something different in my life? What's going on? It's insane when this happens to you because you're a good person. You Close the lid on the dumpster. You pick up stray pieces of trash. You yield to traffic. You keep your yard and your area carefully manicured. You watch out for those water restrictions. All should be going well with you. And then life happens, and it's not. What's going on? What's happening here? And then on the other side, you look at this despicable man named Jacob, and everything's going well with him. Have you experienced this? You're doing all the right things and everything is falling apart. And then that guy over there who doesn't care about the water running down his driveway, who doesn't care about his yard, who doesn't care about doing a good job, everything is fine for him. What's going on? How come this is happening? Jacob is like this. He takes advantage of the blind senior adults in his life. He takes advantage of hungry hunters. He's not a nice man. He should have it rough. And it would be delightful to watch. Wouldn't it? Yesterday, we're having to crawl through this mud pit, and there's these wires that are hanging down, and they carry 110 volts in them. And those are the events that everyone stands around and watches. And they cheer as you're going through that. Gah, gah, gah. People are going, yeah, yeah. I felt like the person in the middle of the Coliseum, and the, all the people watching cheering it on and when you bump into that guy who does everything wrong who's despicable like jacob you kind of want to see him get shot but jacob is on the sideline everything is going well with him everything is fine he should have it rough and it would be delightful to watch his agony just like it would be delightful to watch the yankees lose today or the patriots patriot fan 
No. Anyone? Anyone? Pray for... Oh, my. <laughs> no. But it would be delightful to watch that, that enemy lose. It would be great to watch that. Let's watch Jacob again. Watch in Genesis chapter 29. This man has done everything and possibly that's just frustrating. He's manipulative. And in a sense, he somewhat manipulates God in Genesis 28 by simply saying, God, if you do everything that you say you're going to do and you bring me back to this place, then I'll worship you. He has even nego- he's even negotiating with God. He doesn't wholeheartedly jump in with God. He just kind of halfway does it. God, if you do what, I, what you said, then I'll, I'll worship you as if God is going, oh, phew, I'm glad I have a chance. And then you get to verse 29, or 1, chapter 29. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. He looked, and he saw a well in the field. And behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to these herdsmen, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? Yeah, yeah, we know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? Well, sure, it's well with him. Look, it's well, and here is Rachel, his daughter, coming with the sheep. He said, Jacob said, Behold, it's high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep, go and pasture them. But they said to him, we can't until the flocks are gathered. And they roll away the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. And while he was speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And when Jacob saw her, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban's, Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel kind of forward, if you ask me, and lifted his voice and wept. That's awkward. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran, probably because he kissed her, and told her father, he kissed me. And so then, when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister, he ran, lots of people running, to meet him and embraced him and Well, he kissed him too and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. Laban said to him, Surely you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And he stayed with him about a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? In other words, let me pay you. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and face. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give you her, give her to you, than give her to somebody else. Stay with me. Not a ringing endorsement at all. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed, seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. After you read Jacob's story in 28, concluding in tw- or 27, concluding in 28, you want to see this man wandering in the wilderness all by himself, looking for water and Alone and isolated, he has taken advantage of a blind senior adult. He's lied to his family, and he's stolen from his brother. But no, we find him discovering a well in the wilderness, a place of water. He's wandering out there, and he actually finds a place where he's going to meet people. After I finish chapter 28, I want to see him wander for quite a while, but he doesn't. He looks and he sees this well, and then he gives you a little bit of commentary. We don't know how big this rock was. Some will think that... Perhaps there was a moral reason why the shepherds didn't move the rock because it was ethical rather than moral. It was ethical and it was somebody else's well, so they couldn't move the well rock until the owner, Rachel, got there. Others will view this, the rock was so big it took more than two, three, four, five. Not quite sure. I kind of leaned towards because the rock was so big. And so they stand there by this rock waiting for it, waiting for the owner of the rock or the well to show up. Jacob gets there, and look what he does. He practically tells them what to do. Where are you from, he asks them, nice cordial things. Do you know Laban? Yes, I do. This is them. Yeah, and then he says in verse 7, it's high day. You shouldn't be watering your livestock right now. That's kind of bold. How would you like if someone showed up to your job tomorrow and said, you're doing that wrong? You shouldn't be doing that right now. Your first question would be, who are you? Are you my boss? Teachers, would you like someone to show up in your classroom and say, you're doing all this wrong. You need to do this differently. I live with a teacher. That wouldn't go well. 
What do you mean? You can't tell me stuff like that. I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Or doctors or you professionals or you guys who work in on cars or tools and all those different things. You don't want someone showing up telling you how to do your job. That's exactly what Jacob does. What an arrogant little man. I read that and think, you jerk, you don't get to do stuff like that. You don't know any of these people. You can't walk onto their job site and say, this is how you should do it. Notice what's missing in this story. You see that part there where Jacob prayed? Neither do I. Do you see that part there where Jacob praised the Lord? Neither do I. I don't see it either. Do you see that part in there where he's acknowledging God's presence in his life? Not at all. I don't, I don't see it either. Do you remember the other story where Eliezer goes and looks for a wife for Isaac? What does he do the whole time, it seems? He's praying, he's worshiping the Lord, and he's seeking God. Do you see Jacob doing any of that? This is a Jacob-centered story. God's not, not in here at all. He's not here. We see that he raises up his voice, he cries and he weeps, but does he praise? Does he acknowledge God? Not at all. This is all about Jacob. It's all about him grasping, remember? He's the heel grasper. He's going to grab whatever he can get. So here he is grasping and grabbing. It's all about Jacob. He sees Rachel after telling them what to do. Notice his feats of strength. You know, there's that one ad out there. It's a commercial of this man trying to tell his daughter how to, how to attract a woman. He says, just pick up heavy things. Hold them high. It's, women love that. And it's kind of a silly thing because I don't think women, quite frankly, care. And holding these big, large things. So he sees Rachel coming up. He sees her. And he rushes to the stone and he rolls it away by himself. All by himself. He doesn't need anybody's help. He moves the stone. He's alone. He cries out. It's alone in arrogance. This may be a celebratory cry out uh, in relief or perhaps grief. Not really sure. But at least it's, in my view, at least a way of saying that I made it. I have finally arrived in Haran. I have found my family. I did this. The selfish little man. He kisses Rachel. A few places in the Old Testament actually will say that where a man kisses a woman. And here Jacob, it had to be awkward for Rachel. He just kisses her. He hasn't even introduced himself yet. He gives her a kiss. And I know it's the Middle East, and that might be customary, but this is a stranger. They're out there by a well. They're at work. He rushes up, and he kisses her on the cheek, and then he cries out, Ladies, this is not a good way to meet a man, is it? Mm, not in any culture, I don't think. Uh, and he rolls away a stone. He does it all by himself. He makes a covenant in this story here with Laban. And again, no mention of God anywhere in this place. He does it all by himself. Jacob meets Rachel. He impresses her. It's his uncle Laban's daughter. And then he uh, gets an opportunity to meet Laban. Now, Laban is twice the swindler that Jacob is. He is going to make Jacob blush as far as swindler. Look at the deal that he makes there. He goes back to Jacob's house or to Laban's house. After about a month, they, they talk. He says, tell me what your wages should be. At least the, the brother is, or the uncle is willing to pay. And he describes the girls. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Understand what it says there in verse 17. And Leah's eyes were weak. There's different ways to look at that. Um, in the, in, even in today's culture over in the Middle East, uh, there are bright-eyed girls, you know, dark complexion and maybe blue eyes. But there's a, you've seen this before. There's some girls that have sparkles in their eyes. There's some energy there. There's something about that. I don't know what it is. It could be the color of the eyes. It could be something. But it was highly prized. This doesn't say Rachel was ugly. It doesn't say Rachel was disfigured or any sense. It's just compared to Rachel. I said, I meant Leah. Uh, it doesn't say that she was in any way unattractive. She just... Rachel had something about her that was prized in that culture. It could be the same thing as saying this culture loves curly hair and this culture loves straight hair. She happens to have curly hair. She has straight hair. So she's really pretty. It's as random as that. Okay? So don't view Leah as being an uh, unattractive woman. That doesn't say that. It just says Rachel had a sparkle. She had a beautiful in form and in, in face. And so that's the way to look at this. It's not that Leah was an ugly duckling at all. She may have been very attractive, very pretty. But now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I'll serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now notice how Laban answers this question. Put your lawyer hat on. It is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. Did he say that you can have Rachel after seven years? Did he say, deal? Did he say that? He didn't say that, did he? He just simply said, well, better to give her to you than to somebody else. So stay with me. He didn't say when, did he? 
He did not give a ringing endorsement. Guys, if you ask for her hand in marriage and the father-in-law says, well, I guess it's you're about as good as it's going to get. Oh, boy. <laughs> he doesn't say anything that's real affirmative. He just kind of gives a benign answer. And if you're listening to that with your contract years on and, and looking for a firm conviction of that, that's not it. He doesn't. Laban has just swindled. He has set up an opportunity. Laban is going to take advantage of the deceiver. Aha! And if you know the end of the story, you're like, good, get him. Because this guy needs it. And he's going to get a handful with Laban. It's better that I give her to you than to anybody else. So Jacob served ten, seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him to be but a few days because of his love for her. Jacob enters into a great time of transformation. And he has no idea. My thought is, is that Jacob has that great event, the Jacob's Ladder story in chapter 28. He walks into Haran in chapter 29, and he's thinking, I have got it made. I've got God on the waiting list. If God does whatever I want him to do, then I'll serve him. i got God in my pocket. Everything is fine. He walks into Haran. He beat, meets them at the well. He meets Rachel, and she's all that he's ever wanted in a wife. Remember, he's about 120-plus years old. It's about time he got married. And so he's thinking, this is perfect. I got everything the way I want it. What he doesn't know is Laban is going to eat his lunch. What he doesn't know is that he is not going to come out of this time of, in Haran the same. God is going to rework his life. And you might have had the same experience, obviously different. You wake up one morning, everything is going well, all things are right, and you have no idea what's going to happen next. God is doing something inside of your life. Jacob's in a new city, he's making new friends, trying to establish himself. He tries to tell a group of seasoned shepherds that they're all doing it wrong. He meets a pretty girl, tries to win her over with a feat of strength, moves the stone, waters the flocks, kisses the girl, bangs on his chest like a Tarzan. As she wipes the kiss off her face, he introduces himself. He's acting like Esau, is he not? Just like his brother. He's arrogant, intrusive, aggressive, and shallow. And God is going to change all of that. Of course, we're not as bad as Jacob. We won't be that silly. But we might not be any better off. God is going to do the same thing to you. He is going to rearrange your life in some way, shape, or form, and I don't know what it's going to look like. We know that God has created us for good works, and so He's going to bring that out in us. When you accept Christ as your Savior, He says, Now I have begun a good work in you, which means I'm now going to rearrange you a little bit at a time. And sometimes we like to think, Well, God, I'll get to that a little bit later. I'll get to that a little bit later. God doesn't play that way. God says, No, you're going to get to what I want to get to right now, but we're not going to move anywhere. We're going to stay right here until we fix what I'm trying to fix. We know that the Spirit indwells us, and He's going to help us have the attitude of Christ in us. God is going to change us. It's like two fish arguing over who's wetter when it comes to change. We're all wet. We all need to change. We all need to become something other than what we are. And God is going to work in our lives just like he's going to work in Jacob. God is at work. Jacob doesn't even know it. God is at work in your life. And you might not even know it yet. But you might wake up tomorrow morning to a completely other, a complete different event. So I see Jacob getting established here. see him finding himself. He works for seven years. He starts the 401K. He gets his investments all lined up. Things are going well. It's year six. He's got one more year to work for Rachel. And everything is going well. The new house, the car, the, fur, the donkey, rather. The, all these things are just perfect. And then year seven rolls around. He approaches Laban and says, it's been seven years. And it's going to hit him like a ton of bricks. And it's going to be fun to watch. It's like watching a bunch of people run through electric cords. It's fun to watch. Unless you're the person running through the electric cord. It changes things a little bit. And that's the story that comes up next in chapter 28, 21 through 35. And it's stunning to see how Jacob or uh, how Laban views his daughters. You know what the, the word Leah means? Cow. That's sad, is it not? How many of y'all would name your daughter the word that meant cow? Mm, I mean, how would you do that? You know what the word Rachel means? Rachel, if you're, I can't, I don't see your Rachel. She might be in the back. It means you. It means lamb. Okay, that's a little bit sweeter. Uh, that, that's, that's nice. It's like, 
not a cow, but it's sweeter. But what does that tell you how Laban views his daughters? Like livestock, <laughs> possessions, things he could deal with, things that bring a profit. That's who Laban is. That's sad. We'll see how this blows up on him over on uh, Jacob next week. The thing I want you to take away from this. God is seeking to transform Jacob just like he is seeking to transform us. God is going to change Jacob's life. He is going to change your life. God is going to remodel Jacob's priorities. God is going to remodel your priorities. You have signed up on God's list of projects. And by grace, he is going to make you into something completely different. So let's assume a few things. God is at work. That's the idea of grace. When you walk in here this morning, you need to assume that in everybody's life, God is doing something. That God has something to do. That you are not a finished product yet. That God is remolding and shaping you in some way, shape, or form. God is at work, but He's also at work in your life. God is at work in your life, molding you into the likeness of His Son. That's what He is doing. But here's the question. Will you let Him work? Now that's the idea of passivity. I will just sit here and let God work. There's another side of that, and that is, will you fight him as he works? That's taking an aggressive side. God, I know you're at work. I don't want anything to do with it, so I'm going to fight you on this one. You know, I'm not going to submit to you. I'm not going to bend the knee. I'm not going to allow you to have your way in my life. No. Isn't that a powerful word? When my son says that to me, it's not a good day. No. Oh, boy. we got a different rules of engagement have just changed, have they not? And sometimes we say that to God. No. I'm not going to. You take the passive side. Well, yeah, God, I'm just going to try to sneak through here without doing anything much. The aggressive side, no, I'm not going to. Or will you join him in that work in your life? We can read the story of Jacob, and you can see how Jacob just is a, a swindler. He's walking into a, a firing squad. He has no idea. What would happen if we took a cooperative effort with God, seeking opportunities to grow? If we said, God, I'm going to... I know where you're working in my life, and I'm going to meet you there. I'm going to join you there. I want to work alongside of you. And at that point, then you'll begin to see things changing in your life. You can read the rest of the story of Jacob. Most of the book of Genesis is in some way tied to him. And you'll see how God changes him. You'll see how God brings things back, brings things home to roost. But you'll see how God remodels his life to reflect the values of God. And I pray that after years of walking with the Lord, you'll be able to see how God has remodeled your values, has changed them. Life does that to you. Life is going to change you. Hopefully it draws you closer to Christ. Hopefully you, at the end of the experience, are closer to Him than is when you started. I think that's true for Jacob, and I pray that it's true for you. Yesterday when we finished our last hurdle, I wish it was a hurdle, <laughs> but uh, we had to run through what's called electroshock therapy, and they, all these cords, there's hundreds of them, and you don't know which one of them is uh, electrified. You just don't know which one. And so there's two ways to approach that obstacle. You can try to tiptoe through it, and you keep bumping into the same shock, and you just keep backing up. And Some people would do that. They would just try to do this and kind of walk through it. Some people would try to crawl through it on their hands and their knees, and then they would not only get a face full, a mouthful of mud, which by then it tastes good, but you're going through all that mud. Yeah, it does. After about five hours, it tastes all right. And so they're going through the mud. Or the other way to do that is to lock arms with or stand side by side. And this is what we did. Uh, we stood side by side all five of us, and we got ready. You all ready? And you can feel it. Okay, here we go. In a second. Ready? Not yet. Ready? And you, the, the adrenaline is pumping because all these people are behind you, pushing you, so you don't really have a choice. And you, so you're going to run through these troughs of mud with these electrical things. And look across, and there's Ben, there's Jesse, there's Brian, and there's Lacey. All right, here we go. One, two, 
free. And then you just start running. And zzz, 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 zzz. and every now and then you can look across and you see Jesse going, zzz, doing the same thing, zzz, the same thing. Lacey is making, she weighs like 29 pounds with all the mud, maybe 30. And so she's going, zzz, zzz. and there's Ben and there's Brian. Zzz, zzz. And then you get to the end and you, and you look across and there everybody is. We're done. We're done. Give me the stupid orange thing. This is what we did it for. We wanted to get this. I will sell this to you for $300. I'll sell it to you. This is what we wanted. And a shirt. I'm thinking, this is so crazy. We're doing all of this torturous things for this. But the thing I took away from, and there's a lot of takeaways uh, that came from yesterday, was we did it as a team. Trained with Ben, trained with Jesse, met Brian and met Lacey this weekend. We did it as a team. God is going to take you through something. You know what you need? You need a team. You can't do stuff like that, kind of transformation, without a team. you got to have a team. you got to have a group of people around you that say, ready to go together? Let's go. You're going through that? Went through that before. Let's go together. you got to have a team. You try to do something like yesterday was not a race. It was a challenge. Life is a it's not a race. It's a challenge. you got to have a team. Look to your left, look to your right. That's your team. Try to do it by yourself. You're going to lay in the mud. And there were some people who did it yesterday by themselves. I, I crawled by a lady in a pile of mud under barbed wire. We're bellying it through here. She was in her late 50s. And she's ahead of me. And she's in her late 50s. And we're crawling through there. And she's all by herself. So I get next to her. Come on, Sister Mother, let's go. Let's go. And then so she started crawling. And then she got out and ran off by herself. She was like, and she just got up and ran off. Late 50s. She might have been younger, but she was covered in mud. But she looked like the late 50s. And so off she went. She needed a team. She needed a team. And in life, you got to have a team. You're going to go through some things that you're going to have to have a group of people around you to get you through it. And when you get through this thing called life, it's not this. Aren't you glad? That's Miss Erlene's favorite lines. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you're not racing for a piece of elastic? It's for a crown of life. It's the glory of Christ. You get to that end and you're able to say, I ran the race. I fought the fight. I needed a team. This was the team. I got to the end. God is working in your life just like he's working in Jacob to make you something completely other. Are you going to be passive? God, go ahead and you can do the work. I'll just stand here. Are you going to be aggressive? No. Are you going to say, let's line up and let's get after it. You want to rearrange my priorities? I'm in. Rearrange my priorities. A little bit at a time. God says, I'm a good trainer. I've been doing this for a while. Lots of humans out there. Brought a lot of people. Just trust me. Trust me. I'll bring you to the other side, and I'll give you more than a silly orange bandana that says tough mutter. Mutter even a word. I'll give you something greater, and that's Christ.